much nicer to get out of the office than count on getting some food wherever you are. So Lantana Communications integrates voice, video, data, and security services in order to deliver cost-optimized, efficient solutions. Did you write that, Carl? <laughs> Actually, I did. Oh, okay. Um, that was way too fast. Yeah, okay. Their company has served the Southwest region since 1991, delivering value-added products and services such as call, contact center solutions, IP telephony, unified communications, messaging, mobility, video conferencing, data networking, and disaster recovery planning, which is the topic of their, their session today. Uh, we want to, you know, the purpose of our group is education, and we want to educate you and allow you to get your organization ready for anything that comes barreling up the gulf at us, and so that you all shine and we all get our city back to running as quick as possible. So that's really the goal, and to that end, I've asked them to work on a session today um, to educate you about options you may have in disaster recovery or things to think about. So I'm going to turn it over to Carl, and I appreciate y'all sponsoring it. I think he's going to introduce the members of his team and talk a little bit about what Lantan is doing and uh, what's going on. You're looking at me like, I'm going to do all that. <laughs> well, you already did part of it. Oh, I read your, so, I read so your they're thing. they're not videoing me, so I don't have to worry oh, about that. Oh, I think he is. Oh, yeah, they're they are. That for so, I think they are. We have uh, Jordan that's uh, getting set up that's going to be... Uh, I think I can talk loud enough uh, doing the presentation. We also have uh, William with Invesco uh, that will be helping out on a case study that we talk about. So here's the agenda. <laughs> go through. Um, I won't go into a lot more on the system integration. I think Holly covered most mm -hmm. of it. We do uh, enjoy the Houston Users Group. Great turnout today. And we support uh, this one, also uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth one. We're more of a regional player, although we do have customers throughout the, the United States. Uh, we tend to concentrate more in the um, Texas area, and we believe on having the feet on the streets and the techs uh, locally and at the different places we support. We've got a real good turnout of different people today. We've got the lovely Miss Leah back working the uh, slides back here. We've got uh, Chris Coster, and we've got Dave, uh, Mike. You want to stand up and uh, so I don't forget anyone. Paul, Paul. and we've got uh, George, our director, Bob's, Mary, Brandon works on the uh, maintenance side of the uh, components there. And so, uh, again, thanks for coming. If you've got any questions, these people can help you out. So, uh, how many people know Jordan Reinhardt? Talk to him or heard. Oh, so a good one. <laughs> I was going to say, if, if you don't know Jordan, then you probably know his dad, Jim Reinhardt, who's yeah. been in the Houston market for quite some time now. Uh, the first time I met Jordan, I was going, is this guy out of high school yet? <laughs> you know, and uh, he actually was. But I uh, started to interview him, and I go, wow, we need to hire this guy. So we brought him on. He's done a excellent job for us. He stays on top of a lot of different things on the, the leading edge stuff and uh, is able to figure out a lot of stuff even before Avaya sometimes on how different things work, which is uh, a very good benefit for us. So without any other uh, talk here, we'll have Jordan come up and get started. All righty. So for those of you that don't know me, again, my name's Jordan Reinhardt. I've uh, been with Lantana four years now. And uh, my history, pretty much I grew up with this. I mean, I was helping pull cable, tone, and probe since I was about four. <laughs> so it, it's a good long running history. Um, the backstory of how I got into technology, I was really just trying to understand what my dad was talking about. <laughs> half the time. So by the time I graduated and got into Avaya, um, him and I had a lot more to relate. So we were able to figure things out a lot. So a lot of my experience really comes from his upbringing and helping to figure things out. So that's what we're going to talk about a little bit today. Um, so there he is. He couldn't be here today. He's actually traveling to go see my brother. He's graduating from SIG Corps officer training. So he got pulled in, kicking and screaming into the same industry as the rest of us. 
Uh, so there's uh, Jim, my dad, Evelyn, his wife, my mom, uh, my brother John, Jason, and then my little baby girl, Gracie. Um, we also call her Princess because she will wear her princess dress to Target, <laughs> which is that picture up at the top. So that's a little bit about me. What we really wanted to talk about today was the capabilities that Avaya and just the industry in general has to offer for disaster recovery and business continuity. So when I say BCDR, I'm talking about the capability to fail over, maintain service, and then disaster recovery is what happens after the disaster strikes. So Texas, we've got Hurricane Rita, we've got Ike, we've had Louisiana that had to come in and visit for a few months uh, years ago. And that plays a major impact on the ability to bring up services as well as what happens in the event that this component goes down. So one of the things that we want to talk about first is how do we plan? What, how do we address BCDR? And what I want to get into are the three Ps. So we have plan, prepare, and practice. And then I add the fourth one in is prepeat. So you just go back and continue it all again. So I'm making up words. It's a habit of mine. I <laughs> can't help it. So in the plan section, we're going to go through and identify all of our major components. Users, we're going to prioritize. We're going to look at each different component server level. Back in 2009, there was a similar presentation that my dad actually gave about go and identify those components on the infrastructure side, logins, backups, insurance claims, going through an inventorying. That part is required no matter what infrastructure you have, no matter what industry you're in. This part is really more geared toward the telecom side and making sure that your dollars are still rolling in or you're paying out or your services, whether you're in the government field or in the uh, higher ed industry, it doesn't really matter. You have to maintain your communications. Otherwise, you're dead in the water. There was a study done that said businesses that are affected by BCDR scenarios that aren't prepared, if they're closed more than 10 days, they're out of business. So you have a 10-day timeline to get your communications back up and online fully functional before your business overall is impacted, before they file for bankruptcy. So that's where the BCDR functions really come in, and that's where the risk management teams, that's why they have jobs, is because they're there to keep the company afloat no matter what. So planning is very important. Uh, a couple of the things that we're going to hand out later today, this is just in general. Um, we've got a couple of templates for both end users and call flows. And these are to help you organize and identify who's important and what do we do in the event of a disaster scenario. So the first section is going to cover identifying. The next section is going to cover prioritizing. And then the third section is, what is their BCDR plan? And those all tie in together in the next couple of slides. When you go into planning and preparing, you're going to have uh, basically a project. So everybody knows Microsoft Project or a project plan where you have tasks and who's assigned to them and when are they completed, was this completed, uh, what are my interdependencies, and if I don't have this plan take place, what is the contingency after that? Build a project plan specific for your disaster scenario and have it on file, have it ready to go because when you go into the practice phase, or the implementation phase, you will know, check, 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 here's where we're at. And then the second part is procedural scripts. These are the, you know, when you have a new user hire on and they have their little scripts of what to do and what scenarios, uh, whether they're a call center agent or a new user that's hiring on, you give them the little one-sheeter for how to transfer a call, you need to do the same thing for the BCDR side. So if they're going through and a disaster scenario hits, they get notified, they either go home, they go to an alternate location, or they're on the road because they're part of the risk management response team. So each of them need to have a script of what to do in the event of the scenario. And then practicing is, again, your failover testing. And we have got a third um, document that will help you develop a failover testing scenario in order to go, okay, we're going to bring this box down. What is the expected result? Did we achieve that result? And then get an overall score. 
anytime you get less than 100, there's obviously going to be something that you need to go through and revisit, whether it's a process procedure that was missed, a communication that was left out, or there's a configuration problem in the switch that you need to make a modification to. So we've got all of that covered uh, with the little handouts. We've got them on thumb drives. That way you can take them and go back uh, tomorrow morning or whenever you get the time and begin putting that plan together if you don't already have one in place. And there's the example there. So there's the practice slide. And then the repeat part. So when you go through and you're practicing, you're going to evaluate and make sure everything's there. Take those documented results. Don't try to make modifications on the fly. Document them, note them of what they're doing, and then begin the cycle over again. Go back the next week or the next weekend and make sure that you can have those modifications in place for the next cycle. When you're going into practicing for DR, there are different components that can function. I can fail over one every day if I wanted to, and nobody really knows the difference. I'm just making sure that that component is functional. There are other components where you really want to consider probably doing a quarterly or biannually failover testing because of your continuity practices and your SLAs. So identifying those components, again, in the planning phase will help you in the preparation and the practice. And then just go back and continue that cycle over and over again. So that's really the, how I approach BCDR when it comes to the communication side. Um, if we'll go through the next couple, we've got uh, technology in general. And you said his name, John? Yeah, so oh, yeah. John just talked about uh, PRIs and DRS and then ended it with IP Flex. IP Flex is a SIP based protocol that enables them to bounce between one IP address and the other as they hand off to the end user. So that's where the back end of it, and we'll talk a little bit more, is geared specifically for a, a failover scenario, a disaster recovery situation. And then, of course, the hot topic for the past three months and probably for the next year is virtual enablement. Um, virtual enablement is basically taking your physical boxes, putting them into a software environment, and then having hosts wherever you put them, and then that virtual machine can bounce between all of those different hosts. So we'll take that concept and apply it into a disaster recovery scenario. Uh, and just to emphasize again that the technology for the customer premise is there to help support with the failover situations. Okay, so going on to SIP, um, another four-letter word that I use is ITSP, um, Internet Telephony Service Provider, which, again, Internet Service Provider is the predecessor. It's just your Internet connection for your data. So when we add SIP, we're adding telephony on top of it, so just insert the word there. SIP is based upon realms or accounts, so depending on how many plans and scenarios you want to have in place for your survivability, you're going to have different realms. And the reason for that is each realm has a primary and secondary IP address connection that you can either load balance 50-50, or you can say this is object A, always drop my calls off in Houston. If Houston fails, go to Austin or go to Dallas. And to the service provider, they don't care because it's just an IP address. And SIP also introduces more timers for both a proactive and a reactive failover scenario. So the proactive scenario, that's the keep alive. That's the, uh, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. So that link is considered up as long as we get the yes, I'm here, the Marco Polo concept. When we go over to the reactive side, that's the, I sent you the invite. Did you get it yet? And it continues that process for upwards of 30 seconds. If you don't get a response back, I turn around and I send it down that secondary path. And it's the same exact message, the same exact call. The only thing that the caller hears is additional ringback while they're waiting for the call to be picked up. So the call will continue to process even in the middle of a failover scenario and go to your alternate site. And again, that's all delivered from the ITSP. 
Going into virtual enablement, and I might draw a little bit. I'm notorious for drawing pictures. I can't help it, so you might just have to bear with me for a minute. There are three major components when it comes to VMware in general, or any virtualized environment. But for Avaya, you have to have a VMware backbone in order to support the virtual machines as of today. The first component will be storage. So that's where all of my memory, all of your hard disk space will be logically located. So that's going to be the current status of my virtual machine. That's going to be uh, what are that virtual machine settings and how am I as a cluster of servers configured. The next level out from that is the host. And the host is providing your physical interface. So it's providing CPU, RAM, network connectivity. That's it. Those are the three major functions. If you have any special devices, it will support that on a host level as well. But for the bare bones minimum, again, CPU, NIC, and RAM. So as long as you have enough resources, that machine, that virtual server, will kick up and run. And then third level out, this is the virtualized piece. This is the guest. So just like in a hotel, I could check into one room and switch rooms around however I want while I'm staying there. And that room will always be available, which is the understanding. So each host would be your hotel room, and each guest would be the virtual machine. With NVMware, and there's a, a link here at the bottom, and we'll provide the slides as well uh, when everything's said and done. VMware is built against disaster recovery. They're one of the first to develop a concept called vMotion, which is the ability to take my server, virtualized, and bounce it from one end of the globe to the other end of the globe with milliseconds of downtime. And how they achieve that is, again, you have your host, you have your host, and then you have a centralized storage. Whether it's redundant, geo-redundant, that's a whole other story. It depends on how many dollars you want to spend on equipment. So the more redundancy you have, obviously the higher the dollar tag is associated. But regardless, your host will bounce between each other in order to bring those virtual machines back online to restore that service. In addition, we have the capability within the Avaya world to go active, primary, and then failover for your survivable cores. So there's multiple levels of redundancy that you can take back to your risk management team and illustrate to them utilizing, again, this information that we have here. And I think that's all I've got for right now. Keep talking? Yeah, well, I was going to say if you want to have dialogue. Okay. This thing was for a break, but. Okay. Um, do we have any questions so far on specific practices or where we're at today? So, Jordan, I have a question that, that I was asked recently. So, we have a lot of stuff to test, and we're currently doing BCDR testing at NRG. And so, I mean, obviously, some of our stuff is production environment. You, you test them, you risk dropping calls or interrupting, you know, incoming services. I mean, do, do y'all recommend, or the industry in general, what is the thought about tabletop testing versus live testing? Can you do tabletop testing periodically? Um, okay. How often do you think you can get by with that? Okay, so within a production, especially a 24-7 environment, you have scenarios where if you do test a failover component, then that call will drop. Uh, in that scenario, you're going to want to schedule ahead of time through a change management process and just let them know, hey, we're going to test our biannual uh, failover functionality for your specific functions. And during yes, that test, it will bounce. It still should be live testing. It, it, it should be live testing, but it should be a scheduled testing so they'll know, OK, at 1 o'clock on Saturday, this service is going to go down for about 30 minutes to an hour, depending on what it is you're testing. And then after that, the service should be restored. But you, scheduling it, that would fall under the critical biannual process. That way you know in the event that another hurricane comes rolling through that the failover functionality is there. But I would, I would lean toward, again, the key component is scheduling it out, notifying the end users, letting them disseminate that information, 
and then not do it on a monthly basis or a, a very frequent basis, but yeah. maybe a biannual process. Your question? Uh, I think people are just walking in. Do you have any, like you said you had some handouts. Are they mm -hmm. like more in depth about what you might want to look at, like when you look in your bio to see how things are set or how tables may be built? So, Is that what you were saying? Right. The, the handouts are really geared toward uh, identifying the end user. So if you do a list station or a list agent, you can find that information and just kind of fill in the template. And then the other template was for call flows, so going through list VDN, list vector, figure out where those calls are going, and pasting that information in there as well. So it's a bare bones, in the event of a DR scenario, who do I need to make sure is up, and who do I need to start making test calls to? So it's just kind of a list of things you should check, you mm -hmm. should run off or have set up somewhere so right. you can access it? Right. So, and again, one of our services is consulting and coming in and helping to identify and fill that information out and then expand upon it so that we have the scripts, we have the project plans in place for when you go into a disaster scenario, you have something to go off of. So Jordan has also some information on the advice support side on um, disaster recovery and planning and things like that. And there's um, services that we offer as well to assist and maybe that's our you know backup um, remote backup offers and things like that. So if someone wanted to take advantage of some of the remote capabilities we have, you can couple that with the planning right. solution. And Avai has done a pretty good job of making sure that monitoring the weather plans, monitoring for news events if anything major happens. And they will also post that onto the website with a quick, if you're in this region, click here and we will get somebody to help support you as quickly as possible. So that's a very good point. Do we have anything else? Any questions or what would happen if? Can you give the scenario, and I don't know if you want to draw this, but if, when we're talking about SIP, so uh -huh. with, with Viya versus Session Border Controllers, um, I'm using a scenario uh, with AT&T, using their, their, their circuit, you know, their SIP trunking. If something happens, location A, B, how does, and I know you said one goes here, one goes there, how does it really, is it really that quick, and what happens with DRS or whatever? That's fine. Okay. So can you expand this? You know? All right, so I don't really have a slide specific for that just yet. But you're going to make one. I'll make oh. one. Okay, so again, ITSP would be the equivalent to your PSTN. On one hand, you're going to have your MPLS circuit or your connectivity between your equipment and the service provider at location A, and then you'll have a location B for your disaster recovery. In this particular case, we'll go ahead and put in a session border controller at both locations. And session border controllers provide different levels of information. So they, they function for security purposes, they function for NAT traversal, and they also function in some cases for high availability. Um, and again, this is going up the different levels of redundancy as well. So high availability means both session border controllers are talking to each other at the same time that they're, they're talking to the ITSP and the customer equipment. In the event that one or the other goes down, any calls that were associated with that SBC would be replicated so that there's no loss of talk path. In other words, your calls stay up in that particular scenario. Without high availability, the next step down from there is load balancing, where your service provider hands off every other call to one side or the other. And this also goes for that component level testing to where if you're doing a 50-50 load balance, you know your calls are working. You know that equipment is handing off. Otherwise, you'd get end user complaints. So being able to fail over between one side and the other lowers the impact to the end user as well as to the caller. 
going toward the DR scenario, if I lose my office, so if we have to evacuate the building or power outage or the server itself fries, the ITSP recognizes that this link is down. This IP address is down. So in its world, it has a secondary IP address that it goes, OK, redirect all traffic down to location B until A comes back online, at which point go back to my 50-50 load balance. So those rules are already in place with your service provider. Again, whether it's AT&T, uh, Verizon, Level 3, Paytech, Windstream, all of the different service providers that offer SIP within PLS have the capability to program your failover plan in the cloud. And it's automated. So one of the key benefits of SIP and PLS over PRI DRS is the fact that in a DRS scenario, you're call forwarding. In other words, you maintain a circuit in your A building and another circuit in your B building. In addition, each circuit has to have phone numbers, DIDs associated in order to maintain that service. So when a call comes in to the cloud, I try 555-1234. If that circuit's down, I forward the call to 555-1235. So you're paying double the amount of DIDs as well as the DRS per call rate. In a SIP world, I don't care where the circuit is. I only care what IP address I'm told to go to. I let the network, I let the routing take care of all the other handoffs. So the automated failover at that point, DRS becomes a third level failover plan, where if all of my circuits go down, then I can redirect and go to a call answering service. That way those calls are always answered. I've got William Herrera from Invesco. He's one of the systems engineers slash architects slash everything um, IT related when it comes to deploying the telephony side of the house. So he gets to work primarily with our Lantana folks as far as Chris, Dave, myself in solving any and every problem that, that comes his way that pretty much just somehow lands in his lap at the end of the day. So if y'all can, give a warm welcome to William Herrera. Um, yeah, William Herrera, I with, I'm with uh, Invesco, I've been there about eight years. Um, I don't know about architecture, but I do try to help some of the things that come my way. Um, Jordan, Chris, and David, they are very instrumental in keeping us going here. And they've helped us out in some recent installations. So yeah. With that, um, a little bit about Invesco. We're an investment financial company. Um, we do have about 700 something investment professional professionals, but we have about 6,000 total employees. We have about uh, 20 to 25 European sites, um, 15 plus North American sites, including Canada. And we have uh, uh, several, a handful or so large sites in uh, the Asia Pacific. Um, what we do is um, everything that John and Jordan spoke about is disaster recovery. It's a big portion of our company. We place a lot of uh, time, personnel, and money to make sure that the company keeps going 24 by 7. Um, what we have here is one of the designs that we have. Um, data center, we actually have uh, the data center is our main location, and then we have Greenway. It's another um, survival, survivable side with Austin being our business recovery side. Uh, very recently, we installed 
the current uh, architecture up there with uh, a via system manager in Houston with uh, session borders both in uh, Austin and in Houston and equivalent, I mean, similar redundancy equipment for session managers. Um, we installed SIP trunks and the SIP trunks installed are primarily for the Downers Grove area right around outside of Chicago. So the numbers come in to Houston and through a, um, a split architecture that actually come in um, in Houston and then also Austin. Um, from there through the MPLS, they land, of course, in uh, Downers Grove. All right, so kind of a recap. So we've got the Downers Grove location in Illinois. It's a standalone site with its services primarily being hosted out of the Houston and Austin locations. So there's two major goals that we're looking for with Invesco. One of the major goals is centralized facilities. That's the ability to bring in all of the different numbers from around the globe into one particular location that's housed so that, that makes life a lot easier to manage when it's coming into one facility and then having the disaster recovery in another. With the case of Invesco, we're actually utilizing the 50-50 load balancing concept that we talked about earlier for the capability of if something were to happen within the Houston side, then Austin would be able to pick up automatically and during the actual outage scenario, when that server or that location goes down, only about 50% of the calls would be lost and then it's instant pick up redial to connect the callback. So it's minimal outage. We did not go with the HA solution again because we have the geo redundant that requires uh, what's called a VPLS between the two session border controllers which generates a higher monthly cost that was just priced out of the capability at the time of the installation. So we're just like half step down with the load balancing where each SBC is fully operational 100% of the time accepting 50% of the calls each. So we're minimizing the impact to the business as well as providing the redundancy in the event that one side or the other happens to take a hit. So Jordan, when you're saying 50-50, are all those toll-free numbers or are we talking local numbers? If so, how are you splitting those or are we just talking toll-free? Okay, so paper or plastic, and I say yes. So. With the case of toll-free, uh, Invesco has a very unique setup when it comes to their toll-free handling. Um, they utilize anti-based routing and a lot of service provider IVR type functions. So Verizon actually processes the calls of where is that person calling from regionally. And then whatever toll-free number that they dial will actually hand off to a specific DID, which is the toll-free number itself. With their dial plan, they have a specific range of seven digit numbers that comes in depending upon the location of the caller that came, where the call came from. So Verizon hands us either a seven digit number for a toll free or the 10 digit number for a direct dial. And the SBCs accept both. And then because of the way the SBC processes the calls, anything that comes from Verizon is going to go to Avaya. So in this case, the ITSP side is Verizon. It could also be at and it could be level three. Again, provider side is agnostic to the SBC. Comes from the provider, is handed off to the session manager. Then the session manager takes care of all the special routing. If I can't get to my primary side on the enterprise, where do I go on the secondary side? So there's multiple levels of redundancy throughout the handoff of the call, which generates a lot of the multiple points of failure, which can be an administrative nightmare, but that's why we have the centralized facilities is to maintain that infrastructure for the entire nation. Instead of having multiple PRIs coming into multiple gateways, 
I now limit it down to the two locations that hand off to the network. And again, it's toll-free accepting, it's DID accepting, and in Vesco's case, they're doing special um, anti-based routing within the cloud, and we're just accepting whatever number they hand us. And, and Holly, and we'll lead into it a little bit uh, more later, but we do have the, the load balancing scenario at Invesco. And in our recent installation, uh, as you, you're aware of turnups and cutovers, we did just that. We, when we were in the process of cutting over with a 50-50 scenario through, again, we'll talk about it a little more later, but we did lose calls because we had to go from, uh, we lost one side to go to the other side for um, for more upgrades, whatever. But these were minimal and they were noticed by a dozen or so f folks, but out of 400, it is very small and it was almost in instantaneous when the other side came up. And it's based on next call availability. So, um, in this architecture, one of the other points that I wanted to point that to highlight, Downers Grove is a standalone site. We did not deploy it as a branch location. We we initially discussed uh, making Downers Grove a branch off of Houston slash Austin, but because of dial plan overlaps and, and various different conflicts. Uh, we wanted to make sure that Downers Grove was able to maintain its existing configuration, merging with other sites and taking care of all kinds of other call handling that were unique to Downers Grove, while integrating with the infrastructure available at the Houston and Austin locations. So that's why Downers Grove is standalone. Now, as we'll notice, Houston and Austin as William mentioned, have a standalone communication manager with an ESS at, at its disaster recovery site. In the case of Invesco, we ended up having to delay the SIP turn up overall, so the, the bottom half of the design was delayed, but services were still not impacted because we had that additional layer of redundancy within the session manager. So via session managers are both geo-redundant as well as capable to redirect calls on demand wherever they need to go with both the proactive and reactive timers. So while we were busy working on the SIP trunks, making sure that those were stable with the provider level, we were able to take the Downers Grove outbound calls and redirect them through PRI service at the communication manager level. So it was still SIP, always SIP out Downers Grove. Those end users had no idea where their calls were actually being routed out. And we were able to go through either Houston Austin SIP trunks or Houston Austin PRIs. So Avaya is allowing us to provide probably about five levels of redundancy in both call routing and call processing in order to maintain service. And then the little red lightning bolt for PRIs, that PRI is always up, always running. That's one of the issues with the cost savings of PRI circuits. But in the event of a complete disaster scenario where there's a WAN outage at Downers Grove or for whatever reason that site goes into an island, everything is still serviceable because of the PRI PSTN mixed with a DRS type solution. So I'm not against DRS or PRIs. I'm saying let's utilize the SIP service primarily to help automate some functions while maintaining your PRIs as the Skynet last minute terminator mode failover. All right. Um, just a little clarification. <clears throat> the session managers uh, um, system manager, session board, or controllers, they're in the two locations, but they're primarily in use for Downers Grove, and we're in the process of rolling out that functionality to the Houston numbers. We're, and we are adding other endpoints to that, so it's one of the big pluses of having that architecture right there. So we have 
Anybody have any other questions so far or any ideas that come to mind with the deployment? Anything you want to ask William in particular? In an LSP scenario, what happens? If that were an LSP scenario? In fact, Damage Grove has the, an LSP. Uh, so it's Damage Grove main site, and then right below it is the LSP. And again, we'll lead into it a little bit. And what we did in during the turn up, we had to do multiple uh, revision upgrades to both to all the session manager, session border controller, and the Avaya. We utilized the LSP, kept calls up, did work on the main controller, and then we switched over to the main controller and upgraded the LSP. So the LSP is a great scenario to have there. And you, so, can't, you can't have SIP trunking, for example, at an LSP. It, doesn't, it hasn't been um, it's not necessary for that purpose. Yeah. 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 Okay, so there there were some rumors floating around, and Lee is the queen of rumors when it comes to <laughs> functionality. <laughs> Live and learn. You're in trouble now. Well, she she speaks from her experiences with, within previous deployments as well, and some problems that they experienced when it came to uh, business continuity, disaster recovery, and SIP. Today, the way that the LSP works is just as if it was the communication manager itself. The only thing that you lose when you go into a failover scenario with SIP is the capability to integrate both SIP trunking and SIP users at the same time. The issue is the uh, IMS, there's lower level protocols that tie into SIP, but basically the application sequencing for end users is restricted to just the LSP functionality. You still have to have a full-blown session manager in place at the LSP site in order for both to work. The LSP comes with what's called a branch session manager, and the branch session manager does not support SIP trunking yet. I've, I've been told that that will be coming, but as, as of today, it does not support SIP trunking. It only supports SIP users. So to get around that, that's where you have the PSTN interfaces. That's where you have your, uh, whether it's a media gateway to a PRI or a SIP gateway to a PRI, that's where you provide the local survivability in the event of a failover. Or you get the full session manager as a separate service and deploy it at that local site. So that, that's where there's some confusion. But yes, the functionality is there to support SIP in a local survivable scenario. So kind of tying back, William hit on it a little bit. Um, the deployment was not seamless when it came to the techs that were on calls. I think we were on, at one point, 48 hours straight so there was lots of coffee, lots of Red Bull, Dr. Pepper, <laughs> no does. I can't even imagine. But the reason we were able to get through it is because of the fact that we had planned in the redundancy both the architecture level as well as the personnel level. We had plans in place not only on the telephony team, but also with the network recovery or the network support team. So we had all hands calls with Verizon, Avaya, Lantana, and Invesco, making sure that we were able to redirect traffic and bring up our failover components while we were still working on the primaries and making sure that those components were in place and ready to go. So does it always go well? No. But if you have the right team, if you plan ahead, if you get the right people engaged on that call, you will have a faster restoration time. And then your architecture is responsible to make sure your end users are minimally impacted. The planning of it was several weeks and months in, in uh, advance. But the, the 48 hours. Uh, 
was needed. You, you, chances are you're not probably not going to get around that. But as Jordan is saying, make sure that you have those teams in place, the network folks, all your providers and your vendors, uh, and it'll make make it a lot easier for you. And coffee. And coffee. Lots of coffee. All right, so we talked about centralized facilities a little bit. Just to recap, the, the main benefit was ease of management. This is the capability for William's team to be able to go in and get a trouble ticket from an end user or be able to address any possible project that comes through. Administering the same infrastructure that's in place. Again, you have multiple points, but when it comes down to it, you're centralizing all of your facilities globally or nationally and then enabling the management team to administer just that one specific set of equipment instead of various different sets throughout the nation. So it's part of the, the con flatten and consolidate movement, so to speak. The second part is the faster turnaround on capacity and feature deployments for your end users. Again, it's the same infrastructure that's in place that's going to support the capability to scale up or scale back as well as pick and choose what features you want to deploy for your end users. Uh, right now we're in conversation making sure that the mobility team is able to support end user functionality, whether they're on their cell phone, iPad, laptop, desk phone, hotel room, getting all of those different bundles together to help support both audio, uh, video, and conferencing video sharing capabilities to make the collaboration within their teams more cohesive. We talked about deployment of MPLS connectivity as well as ITSPs and the key considerations we just tackled. The contingency planning was the biggest savior in all of this. We had our teams in place, we had our failover components in place, and then we were able to address the main critical components that were failing, but we were able to resolve those in a fast turnaround time while minimizing impact to end users. The two other components that you want to make sure are in place are security and quality of service. And this ties more uh, to SIP today because of things like denial of service attacks. And we've got one last, uh, last slide, not right now, but uh, toward the end. There are security measures in place, just like with any data protocol that's out there. You're going to have a firewall. You're going to have a session border controller. You're going to have security policies. Every company is different. Um, and I'm going to dog Invesco a little bit, but y'all are more secure than the government. <laughs> so, and you have to be, because y'all are in the finance industry. So um, it's, it's both a blessing and a curse. I mean, it's a blessing because you know your data is safe, your information is secure, but it's also a curse because you have to make sure that every time you go through, all those key points are checked off. So it, it does become a management issue, but again, you get the right people in place, you're going to minimize that impact. All right, now we can go. Um, automated redundancy. Again, that this is the, the failover scenarios. This is the the testing in the 50-50. So, William, you want to talk about the load balancing a little bit, both inbound and outbound? Um, the load balancing, um, I mentioned a little bit about how the calls come in. And again, this is all seamless to the client. You know, come in 50% Houston, 50% Austin, and um, they just terminate in, in the uh, Downers Grove location. Similar with outbound calls. Outbound calls initiated in Downers Grove, 50-50 across two networks, and exit. Works very nice. Okay. And then the other uh, consideration we talked about a little bit, CM at the Houston site being the alternate service provider, basically. The CM. So we had the Downers Grove location, talking to the session managers, and then redirected calls out through the local CM at the Houston office. And that was one of the methods that required manual intervention, 
but you can put routing policies in place to where if I cannot get out any particular SIP trunk for whatever reason, whether the service provider is down or I've got network problems that are spiking, I can manually or automatically engage the session manager to redirect calls out through the PSTN. Initially, we, because of the location that Downers Grove was moving to, there was a lot of discussion with the um, telco provider about relocating, uh, porting the numbers from one side to the other side. A lot of discussion going back and forth, but we decided we knew we were gonna have this session board controller in place. The first uh, option was to have the calls, because they were already gonna come in to Houston and Austin. So from there, if the calls came into Houston and Austin, could, if we could not complete the calls, uh, rather port the numbers over there, then we could utilize our local telco trunks and, and terminate them that way, instead of using the SIP all the way. So that was another one of the things for the beauty for the uh, redundancy there. All right, and we talked about the architecture, how we achieved the redundancy, how we achieved the automation. Uh, a couple of the key considerations, automated redundancy is great, but inevitably there will be a time where you have to take a box down, whether it's maintenance reasons or the, the automation's not working, there, there will come a time to where manual intervention will be needed. The telco, the ITSP side, your PSTNs utilize DRS or whatever the, the local LEC is offering for your, your portal-based failover. Um, there are some customers even in the Houston area that utilize all the different DIDs and failovers and PRI terminations, which is fine and dandy, but you still have SLAs. In other words, your service provider is not going to say it's instantaneous. You're putting in an order to say activate the, the DRS plan, and then after that order is processed, your calls will redirect. Within the SIP world, you own that failover capability. You're managing it yourself. So you can log directly into the box and force calls to redirect how you need them to go, whether you're call forwarding off to an a auto attendant or answer desk, you can interject those policies yourself and save that money. So there is an ROI to be had by going with a SIP service provider and a SIP infrastructure. Invesco has, I would say, probably hundreds of this uh, DR plans that John mentioned. And 90% uh, of them never get touched, but then eventually the multiple clients will put in a request to change this number to forward from here to a different number that's already in place with the provider. So it's, it takes a lot of manual intervention, a lot of calls, and it cannot be done on the fly. And of course, as you all know, when we get the request, they want it done now. We can't do it now. So one of the big reasons of trying to utilize the SIP so that we, as maintaining it, we can do it quicker and more accurate on the fly. All right. And then going back, again, I promise, this actually came from Avaya, so thank you, Avaya. This slide here illustrates more of the flexibility for your session border controllers to be deployed in any given topology. Um, in some cases, you can utilize the session border controller as your data firewall, as well as your telephony firewall to interface up to the internet. It has policies in place to help prevent your DOS attacks and port scanning and all those fun features to prevent toll fraud, which is a major security concern today. The external firewall helps to prevent that. The internal firewall also helps to filter out. Since you're going into a DMZ environment at Invesco, you have both an external firewall to handle the traffic, to be able to interface with multiple clouds while maintaining security. The session border controller maintains the SIP level security of making sure that 
unauthorized people aren't trying to register or make phone calls on Invesco's behalf. And then the internal firewall is always going to be in place when, whenever you have a DMZ network. It's going to allow specific servers and specific applications to access certain networks and only those networks. So it helps separate everything out, which also helps maintain PCI compliance and HIPAA compliance. So that's pretty much all we have as far as the case study goes. Uh, again, if you all have any questions, now's the time to ask Holly. Okay, my, my questions aren't technical, but one, what was your timeline to implement? And two, did you have a budget and did you stay within it or how did you get the funding to be able to implement all this? Yes, the, um, certainly we stayed within budget. Timeline, again, uh, this uh, took several months talking again, speaking with the carrier, again, the big issue that we had, we had was the uh, capability of porting the numbers. But once we got that ironed out, uh, and again, that was pretty much towards the last minute thing that they said that it could, they could do that. Uh, planning was several months. Um, speaking with the infrastructure folks, the carrier folks, uh, telco, us, Lantana, um, we had to confirm firmware revision numbers between um, session border controllers, uh, system managers, and all that, make sure that all that was uh, uh, possible. That last slide that he showed uh, between the firewall and the carrier and the endpoint, that part, 95% uh, of it was done before the cutover weekend. That last part was took like, you know, the 48 hours. Yeah, which again, it's, it's probably can't be done seamless, you know, as, as easily as just a regular PRI installation. But again, having your parties in place, we were able to complete it. Was there something that happened that caused you to do this investment, kind of in this whole DR reevaluation of your your whole network? Did something happen or? or I mean, obviously, you didn't say what your budget was, but I'm kind of seeing a lot of dollar signs here, maybe. It's, so. it's Invesco's direction to go to one platform, and we're going to be Avaya, and also to go more SIP based again, for uh, us having control of our disaster recovery numbers so far telco to multiple locations. So to be able to really respond, I guess, quicker by you having control versus before, maybe that would have been an extended outage while y'all did a lot of manual intervention. Exactly. And people can't get to their money and they don't like that. Yeah, yeah I mean, um, did you mention the, the 10 hours of yeah. some, yeah. the other gentleman mentioned 10 hours of being downtime and you're out of business. Oh, 10 days. 10 days. Mm -hmm. Well, we're like 10 minutes, and then that's oh, it's, it's bad. So we, we have to spend quite a bit of time and effort to make sure everything stays up. Right. A couple thing, uh, other things, too, Holly, is that we're expecting to see our operational costs go down. And by uh, th this is our first step in the, well, second step, but our first big step in the SIP. And what we're expecting is to be able to reduce the number of PRIs across the region. And once we start reducing PRIs and we can reduce the amount of the, the, uh, the DRS plans, we expect, we expect to really reduce our, our operational costs. And, and not only here in the United States, North America, but across the globe as well. So as soon as we get this stood up, which, which we have, then, then we also have plans on standing it up in, in our uh, in land, in London side. So it had a cost containment reduction component built into the whole DR. That's right. Okay. Exactly. Yes. Of course, I want to know about the context in our aspect of all of this picture. Thanks, Pam. The multi-agent or audio or video? I need to know it all. Okay. Yeah. All right, so within contact centers themselves, I'm going to lean toward elite multi-channel uh, in particular. We have, uh, I believe in 6.3, Lloyd, you're going to have to make sure I'm on point, but 
within the later releases, they are introducing both redundant and geo-redundant uh, serviceability. The way that Elite Multi-Channel integrates within the Avaya Red Communication Manager platform, you have your multi-channels, which are your IMs, your emails, your audio contacts, all rolled into one agent desktop, and then you can distribute out uh, accordingly. So having both VPN access, whether it's innate to the, the OS or if you have a Junos type VPN connection that just launches when you turn your computer on, uh, that login connection will be maintained to the internal equipment as well. So that, that leans more toward the data side of the house. But in the event that Elite Multichannel goes down, the way that the Avaya Communication Manager ties into it, you're still distributing calls within your local call center agent. So, and I don't care where that audio comes from, as soon as it hits the CM and hit, goes through my ACD functions, I'm going to pick and choose which agent to go based on who's logged in. That ties back more to the end user contingency planning, the three Ps that we were talking about earlier, where you identify your agents that are able to work from home, your agents that have to go to an alternate site, or the agents that are just out of the water while they are in a disaster scenario. So developing those plans on the logistical side helps to maintain the serviceability of the contact center with the technical equipment that's already in place. Thank you. So in regard to Invesco, um, were your contact center locations impacted in your, your planning as well? Um, no. Well, again, just for that, that brief period. Uh, and again, the, the beauty of the SIP and the LSP scenario, it was like seconds. There were drop calls and there were complaints but 99% of the time, either the client called back in or the agent was able to call back out and reestablish everything. Okay. All right. Do we have any other questions from the group for Invesco? But one thing to you, Mike, state is, is we architected it. So even though we have one set provider now, Verizon, so that we can add additional set providers so that we can, we can have some you know, redundancy when it comes to uh, providers as well. Right. So what uh, Robert was getting at is it, the first diagram doesn't really show it. We, it focuses more on how it's deployed today. This slide here allows us to look and see the replication of the carrier itself. So I can have another redundant MPLS uh, Verizon circuit come in. I can have redundant or Verizon and AT&T or and level three. I can have multiple service providers coming into my external firewall, hand off to my session border controller in order to reach the internal cloud. So when I go and forward between service providers, because as Verizon, you're not going to allow your calls to fail over to AT&T. You're going to try to maintain that call on your own network. <laughs> that would be a very interesting feature. Oh, wow. mm, let me think about that. OK. <clears throat> on, on the inbound flows. But you can tell AT&T, especially with toll-free numbers, you can tell AT&T or Verizon, you know what, forward to this DID, and that DID just happens to be associated with the other carrier. And again, that's all account-based, so you can, have multi, you can have a range of DIDs from around the globe on one SIP service provider, another range from around the globe with the alternate service provider, and just tell them, you know what, manual intervention will be required, similar to DRS, but call forward these numbers to those numbers. So forward from A to B. And the inbound flows, once it hits that session border controller, will deliver to your PBX. And then outbound flows, again, those are automated. I can pass along whatever caller ID I need to pass along with the carrier. So I can pick and choose on the carrier level. If A is not available, go to B and vice versa. But your caller ID is still going to show up with that same information. William, when did you implement this? Um, 
June? Last month? Yeah. Oh, Late June. Month? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's been tested. Oh, okay. <laughs> it, it, we, we were, that was part of that 48 hour window. So one of, one of the issues that we had was software specific. I've just opened yes. this on us. So we had to uh, force an upgrade between both the session border controllers that were deployed as well as the PBX itself. And again, the redundancy components kicked in to help us test the failover while we were resolving the problem. So we forced calls out 100% through Houston while we upgraded Austin to resolve that software break. And then we redirected 100% over to Austin at that point, the problem being resolved, to work on the Houston side. So, and again, within the session border controllers, in Invesco's case, it was next call failover. So whatever calls that were active during the time of the failover were dropped, but next call were able to restore service. So it wasn't an outage more than a few seconds to the end users. It's that it was as if I'm on my cell phone driving down the highway and I go under I-45's overpass and drop the call. So it's easier to explain to the end users. Within the communication manager side, we had to perform an upgrade there as well. What we did is we failed over to the LSP. And in fail over to the LSP when you're forcing it, all the phones that are not on a call will re-register. And then any call that is already on a conversation will maintain that conversation until it hangs up. Once they hang up, they automatically go to the LSP at which point we perform the upgrade of the main server. The part that I just left out was the LSP was upgraded before we did any of that work. So once they failed to the LSP, we were able to test and make sure that the issues there were resolved as well. So what did you upgrade to? We started at 6.0 with the latest service packs for that particular release. And then we ended up upgrading to 6.2 uh, because of a few uh, SIP related uh, bugs that were uh, impacting service. So 6.2 had a lot of corrections geared towards SIP and going into 6.3 they did a lot of enhancements that were geared toward the virtualization world. So, so if someone deploying SIP for the first time, which release would you recommend? I would recommend 6.3 which is the latest GA release as of today. All right. Anybody else have any considerations, questions?